Good afternoon, everyone. My name's John Norcross. I'm practice manager of uh, Library House Surgery in Chorley, and I've been part of the uh, Chorley Central uh, project team on this uh, population health management um, pilot. So, um, yeah, I've got my colleague Irene Elwell with me as well, who um, has been a link worker who's seen some of the uh, cohort of patients that we've been working with, and she's going to uh, share a patient uh, story for further on in the presentation. Um, so just what, what I'm looking to um, cover over the next few minutes really are um, overview of uh, the project that we've done, um, sort of our proposed roadmap or the roadmap we've sort of been through with um, with this project, share with you some of the um, highlights of the pilot, and then, uh, like I said earlier, we'll, uh, we'll finish with a, a patient story, because um, it's not all about... Um, fancy pictures and graphs, as was uh, said earlier. So uh, we'll com come back to you with a patient story as well. Okay, so there are, there, there are um, a number of similarities um, between this project and, and, and the presentation just had from our colleagues over at Burnley, which um, I take as um, reassuring. That's on the uh, assumption that we've both not got it com uh, completely wrong. Um, so I'll take, uh, take that as uh, comfort. Um, and the, the sort of approach at the start of the project was um, meeting as a group of, uh, a group of practices, as a, as a primary care network. Um, we were thinking about a lot of the stuff we'd, we'd done over the years and done together. And um, working in primary care, I'm, I'm sure you, you, this will have been your experience as well or something similar to that. A lot of our focus over the last few years has been about who are these really unwell patients who are going to A&E, who are having emergency admissions, and, and, and what do we do to try and work with those patients and solve that? And having done that for a number of years, we wanted to do something completely different. We work in these types of, type, types of ways, and um, over time, there were people at the start of those types of projects who were um, attending perhaps A&E unnecessarily or having emergency admissions that were avoidable. But the more that we worked that group and over a number of years we were having sort of MDT meetings and that sort of stuff, I think, well, actually pretty much everyone we're now discussing at this point in time was really unwell and unfortunately needed to go to hospital. So we thought, well, let's shift that on its head and let's think about how do we work with um, a group of patients who, who, were, who were before that point, who were sort of lower down the, the pyramid of care. And how do, we, how do we work with those? And is there anything we can actually do with those patients? Uh, the cohort of um, patients that we um, selected to work with we, we were very much in mind with people before they needed you know, significant um, hospital in intervention and that type of stuff. And we worked with a group of patients with an age range of 45 to 60 who were moderately, moderately frail and who also had 10 plus GP uh, practice appointments within a year. So these patients are fairly high intense users of primary care, but not necessarily um, A&E and those types of, uh, of services. And what we wanted to um, then do with those cohort of patients was um, provide them with a face-to-face -face visit with a link worker um, to signpost to potential appropriate services that they hadn't accessed and also as was mentioned in the previous presentation to uh, complete a patient activation um, measure or PAM score um, which I'm pleased my uh, colleague uh, was diligent enough to uh, explain what that was in more detail um, than I'm going to um, but I think you got the premise that it was how engaged and activated is that patient um, in their health and their care of and how, how, how resilient are they. Um, so from that point, um, interventions are identified and implemented. And then what we want to do as well is the initial um, activation measure was sort of the baseline for that um, patient. And then 12 weeks further on, we want to do another um, patient activation measure score as well. And Obviously, we're hoping that there's been an in improvement in that score and that patient is more activated and engaged in the care of their health. And a lot of this is um, we know that um, we need to do things differently and there's not necessarily loads more resource to do that. But we just think that the more activated a patient is in looking after themselves or, or, or having people who help them to look after themselves, that should, in theory, reduce some pressure in primary care. My colleague previously talked about they have better outcomes. There's evidence that these patients will 
need to access services less, but also will have a better quality of life and better outcomes for their long-term conditions. And for us, this is a way of, it's a way of measuring what's happened with that patient. Um, and and it's, 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 it's strange because we always get measured and monitored around money spent and cash and things like that. Whereas if we do something well at this stage, all that won't be spent, but how do we then measure what, what wasn't spent on that patient? So we just feel that the activation measure is a, is a good way to do that. Okay, so um, this is sort of our sort of roadmap, what we, what we went through, um, and I'll just talk through each of these in a, in a little bit more detail over the, over the coming slides. Okay, so the first point of the roadmap was our, our vision, and this was really about wanting to improve individual and community resilience, and that, and that uh, again, is about helping um, to reduce some of that pressure in primary care through, through helping people to engage in, in uh, maintaining and looking after their own health. Um, there's some of the things we felt we would need to know throughout the project. Under, trying to, we would need to understand our community better, the individuals involved in the um, project, the patients better as well, and what were the determinants of individual and community resilience. So the next part was we, we sort of decided who the stakeholders were, who we wanted to meet with, who we wanted to um, form relationships with or develop existing relationships with. And that's just a, a snapshot of some of the, the people who've been um, involved in, in the project. Um, GP practices, uh, local council, Chorley Council, have been in, incredibly um, supportive. In fact, they seconded um, one of their uh, teams to come and work with us, which is, which is Irene. Um, we've worked with the Acute Trust and Community Services in, in terms of gathering data, the CCG, um, the CSU and BI, BI teams have been key, and obviously Kate coming out and, and coaching us and helping us um, with, the, with the project. Um, so uh, I'm sure that other people who, who've been doing the pilot will recognise that data sharing is a big part of... Um, well, one of the more significant challenges within um, the uh, projects um, obviously needs to be legal, safe and secure between stakeholders and practicing CC CSUs are central to that. Um, what, what, we, what we did within the project, we tried to identify the cohort, cohort of patients um, fairly early on within that. And we did, we identified, I think it was circa 110 patients across um, the network across seven practices that was and with identifying those so early on we were then able to go out to those patients to get basically full full consent to complete this this pilot to to share data on them and I think that really helped in terms of what we were able to then do in terms of the wider picture of data I know that's not necessarily hel helpful when you're talking about a population of 53,000 um, in a network I'm sure no one wants to go out and try and consent 53,000 um, people but it just allowed us to uh, to, do, to do that within this project and um, we also work closely with the, our CSU and, the, and their uh, business information teams and uh, just want to show an example of some of the stuff that we've, we've, we've been able to do working close with them and getting um, that patient consent at an early uh, point in the project. So, um, appreciate that's not going to be readable for most. In fact, it's not that readable for me from here, which is uh, rather worrying. Um, so, this um, basically is just, we wanted to sort of, sorry, it's not playing ball. Oh, there we go. Okay, that's better. So, we had a cohort of patients, and we wanted to get the wider sort of picture of data. Um, on, the, on those patients to get a real understanding what they were about. And I appreciate moving forwards with population health management. It will be more the data that drives the decisions and what we do, but it was sort of a both at once approach in, in this project. But having you know, established the cohort of patients, we wanted to know, um, know the data all around. And what you can see there is things like um, seg some of the more usual stuff segmented by age, gender, um, number of primary care uh, appointments and that, that, that sort of stuff. We're also able to then do things which we, we perhaps hadn't thought about or, or hadn't done before. And this is, um, this is the patient cohort segmented by ACORN wellbeing type. Um, so the chart there um, shows patients um, by ACORN wellbeing type, which sort of um, 
was interesting to us, and you, you probably can't read it there, but one of the larger percentage um, groups of people there was what's called hardship heartlands, which you think, well, that yeah sounds like the pe sort of people who might be involved in in something that needs an intervention or management. But then also the sort of second biggest group within that was everything in moderation, which doesn't necessarily strike you as a group of patients on the face of it or a group of people who you might feel um, were crying out for some some intervention and work to be done with. Um, so that was uh, interesting. Um, Okay, as so, well, this is um, building on the theme of um, having a, a theograph, and this, um, our, our thanks to our CSU team and uh, Ruth and James for, for working so hard on, on this. What you can see, see there is, um, that's one of the patients within, um, within the population, and it shows there, um, their attendance is at primary care, 111 uh, service, the urgent care center, A&E, outpatients, elective admissions and non-elective Admissions, so you can see there where that per person's been on uh, throughout that 12-month period. But if you see in the bottom left-hand corner, what we've also um, done as well there is that shows um, sort of the intensity of that activity. So when you just put it into that 3D sort of perspective, it gives you a real feel for where the intensity of that use has has been. And um, when you put that for the whole patient cohort, all the sort of intensity was around primary care and some outpatient scene stuff and elective care, and there was very, very little in the sort of 111 A&E type stuff. So this really is a different type of cohort of patients than we are used to um, working with. Um, some people get really excited, and that 3D graph there, Dr. Shashi Kandavali um, was so excited by that. We've had to um, send him on a holiday um, just to recover, which is why you've got me uh, stood here this, uh, this afternoon. Um, so yeah, that's just our sort of longer term aim around this as well is that, that by, by continuing sort of down this, this method is that eventually we want to be able to sit down there in an MDT meeting and right, okay, who are these patients we're talking about? This is the patient we're talking about. You hit that button and then you get this richness of data. You can have a theograph and you can have that in, in 3D for intensity of activity, you can see who's that person, what's their uh, acorn type, and all that sort of, sort of um, thing as well. You heard it mentioned earlier about our, our council being very supportive, and they managed to get data on assisted bin collections, which within this cohort of patients, it was in the high 80% were having assisted bins. So this for us is a real new way of looking at things, and perhaps, well, okay, so maybe we don't look at long-term conditions, maybe we look at who's having a hand, having the bin put out and that sort of stuff. So it's a been a real good learning opportunity for us as well. I think we'll just change the way we view things and approach things. So just another example of a, a patient there. And again, you can see it, it, it just, just shows what, where they've been and for what appointments. I know you can't see it in, in great detail from where you're at, but the, the, the slides will be um, shared. In fact, I've said Dr. Cannavale is on holiday. I'm not so sure. He might, he might be with his legal team uh, copywriting the graph in the bottom left-hand corner, but... Uh, Maybe not. Okay, then the, the, the sort of final part of the roadmap was the intervention which, um, which Irene's been doing for us from a sort of more link worker, social prescribing type perspective. And it's been a one-to-one, face-to-face -one, uh, -face intervention. That's, again, uh, it being in connection with the patient activation measure, which I won't, uh, won't go into again. Some of the, some of the highlights of our pilot and perhaps uh, hopefully helpful for those who are perhaps thinking about a population health management approach. At the start of the project, we thought we want to put some resource into this and actually see if it is going to make a difference and do, and do something. Um, so we put on a sort of an open house approach. And so for the sort of 20 week period at the Trulli surgery, that has been there on a Thursday for people who are involved in this project to go along there and do some work and sit around the table and have conversations, which I think is why the list of people who've been involved in working with us has been so, so, uh, so big as well. Um, also just been through the slides on business intelligence. Um, sorry, just going back to the open house. What we found was we, we had a, sat around that room, sat around that table, a, a group of people who were only interested in getting on and getting something done, a real can-do attitude. And that was really um, infectious. And what it also meant though, is if anyone came along to that meeting who, that wasn't, who wasn't of that mindset, they sort of didn't come again. So it was sort of a natural selection process as well. So we found that quite useful. I don't, I don't know, not a very scientific method, I appreciate that, but there you go. Um, so I've been through the business intelligence stuff. 
Um, also how it's been support from our partners, from the council, from 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 business in, in intelligence, from from our CSU. That's been really positive and 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 and, and really good to see. Um, we feel we've got a model which we can um, take forward as, as as well, and and the cohort of patients will change driven as the data becomes better and more more ready, readily available for us. But I think the key thing as well is making a difference for patients. And these are patients who might not necessarily get thought about within, within primary care. Um, we might get sort of overlooked until, um, uh, until they get really unwell. Um, so yeah, I'm going to uh, ask Irene if she'll uh, just share one of the uh, cases she's uh, been out to, to do. Being told I've got to be really, really quick. <laughs> I can't promise that. Um, basically, um, I went out to see this patient um, and after an initial conversation, um, we filled out the PAM um, and she came out at level two, um, which gives us an idea that she needs that little bit more help. Um, so she discussed how she had hypertension, asthma, um, she had cataracts, um, she had knee problems, she just had a, a knee operation, um, but she went into a lot of detail around like a daughter she's a full-time carer for a daughter who was 18 years old um, and she was severely disabled and she'd had loads of difficulties in the past 12 months around her um, transition to adult services she talked about being um, not sleeping very well and being stressed and being anxious about going out and about so she was already part of Lancashire Wellbeing Service, um, but she had um, two, two appointments left with them. Um, and we tried to kind of look at what I could do to help her. Um, one being that her cataract operation had been cancelled, um, but she hadn't chased this up. So I encouraged her in, just in that one appointment to maybe chase that up because it was something that was causing her a lot of distress as well. Um, we also talked about um, things that she could do within the community because she was really interested in doing something for herself but wasn't quite sure what she were to start. So what we agreed when I left was that I would look a little bit into the, um, the support for her around her daughter's um, care. Um, so we agreed that I would contact um, the continuing healthcare service um, and also her SEND um, worker to see if they could just basically give her a bit more information. She was feeling very out of the loop, um, not able to kind of give her, her have the support around her to, um, to move things forwards. Um, I would contact her Lancashire Wellbeing Service um, worker to make sure that I wasn't du duplicating any work that she was already doing with her and also a referral to community development team within Trawler Council, which is where I also work, um, to see if there's anything that they could do in terms of wrapping a bit, a bit around her, just to see if they could put her in contact with the right services that might be able to help her. So I did this um, and I did a four week follow up um, just to see if things were kind of progressing for her. Um, she'd been in touch to get her cataract sorted and she'd actually got a cancellation and had the operation. Um, the continuing healthcare um, worker had been in touch and they'd actually met and put a plan in place and her daughter's care was going over to a PA service. Um, the SEND worker at LCC um, had been in touch, they had an appointment but they, they were also making sure that the school that her daughter was going to were also involved in that as well. Um, and our community development team had been in touch um, and they'd actually arranged for her to look at volunteering for a parent and toddler group um, for the time when she's um, not looking after her daughter and also looking at a cookery course because she talked about wanting to lose a bit of weight but wanted to do it around what she, like in learning how to cook properly. Um, and I'd also just last week had a email from her Lancashire Wellbeing Service um, worker saying that they'd just finished their, se their sessions, but just thanking me to like kind of moving things across along for her because no, they weren't quite sure where to start. So I am due to see her in a few weeks time um, just to do the, the, the last session with her um, for the PAM um, and also just to see if there is anything else that might, be, might help her.
Thanks, Irene. Um, so just really quickly, just to, to wrap up with, um, so what, what now? Well, for our pilot, we've, um, out, of the, out of the cohort of 81 that consented to, to having um, Irene visit them, um, there's 13 of those patients left to see, but then there's the follow on in a 12 weeks time um, where um, we'll revisit the uh, PAM score and uh, Irene will, will go out and see them again. I think you, you know you're doing that, don't you? Yeah, all right, it's good she knows that. She's been seconded um, for at least another 12 weeks uh, off our council. Um, so that, that's what's next for us, but we, we just feel that it's, it's been a real worthwhile experience. We've learned so much, and we, we will take this as a way going forward. But also, for, what, what about population health management in other networks? Well, we just think, we, we talked, didn't we, about resource and who, who can do this and who can get on with this, but I think there is a unique opportunity within primary care at this point in time. You know, we've got clinical pharmacists, coming to join our network, social prescribers coming to join our, our network. And when you think about that, that's one individual in a population of potentially, well, in our case, 53,000 people, what do they do? And I guess the tempting thing for practice might be, well, let's just carve that time up and give them a little bit of time in each practice. And I guess what would the impact of that I, I would strongly suggest not not as much as if you find a cohort of patients and really target those and and and, and try and make a difference hopefully you've heard that that's made a difference for the um, patient irene uh, discussed but um yeah so that's uh, that's it from me thank you